Our sermon text this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 26, verses 1 through 15, and we read in Jesus' name. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord, all the words that I command you to speak to them. Do not hold back a word. It may be that they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way, that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law that I have set before you, and to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets whom I send to you urgently, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a curse for all the nations of the earth. The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets to the officials and to all the people said, This man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against the city as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words you have heard. Now therefore, mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold... I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for faithful messengers that you have sent to us. We see them in your text in in, in the Old Testament. We see the prophets coming before the people. We see them with the apostles and we see them with pastors and preachers today, Lord. And so we pray, Lord, that the words of my lips would be true. The words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever been accused of doing something wrong that... uh, you thought was right? Have you ever been accused of doing something that was bad, that you thought you were trying to do something good? In our gospel reading this morning from Luke chapter 11, Jesus was doing something good. He was casting out demons from people, people who were possessed, who were being controlled by Satan himself and his minions, and and Jesus was setting people free from prison in this way. But People came and they said, he is casting out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Others tried to test his authority and demanded signs in order to show that what he was doing was good and right. We have a similar thing here in our Old Testament reading this morning from Jeremiah 26. Jeremiah receives a command from the Lord to preach. He says, go into my house, go into the temple and preach the words that I say to you. The command wasn't to keep the message light and uplifting. The command wasn't to make people feel pumped up for their week and inspired to go and do amazing things. The command was simple and clear. Say that which I have spoken. Nothing else but every ounce of it. Don't leave out a word, Jeremiah. Reminds me of uh, when somebody says, hey, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind, right? Those are the types of words you don't want to hear 
Because you know what you're going to have is a hard conversation, one that you aren't looking forward to, they're probably not looking forward to, and anybody who's around you probably doesn't want to hear. You don't think, oh boy, this is going to be fun. You think, oh no, what's coming now? Nobody looks forward to those hard conversations, but God commands Jeremiah, who, who sometimes we call the weeping prophet, because he, he, he weeps as he has to deliver these messages, these messages of judgment from God upon his people. He says, you need to have this hard conversation with my people. They need to listen to me. So God is going to speak in order that Judah, his people, would turn from their evil ways and that they would turn to him and that he would be able to relent from doing that which he has called in the book of Isaiah his alien work. That God's desire is not to bring this disaster on his people. God's desire is not to punish the wicked, but that this is the result of our wickedness and his righteousness that these two things cannot go together. And so he, he pronounces the law, he pronounces the judgment upon Zion, upon Jerusalem, upon Judah. And uh, he, he says, hey, go right into my house, right into the temple where all the people will be gathered and tell them this alien work that I'm about to do, this harsh word that I have for them. It says, As he speaks, he says, this is what you're going to say. If you listen to me, listen to God, to walk in in God's law that he has set before you, and you listen to the words of God, and you listen to the words of the prophets whom I've also sent to you urgently, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh. I'll make this city a curse for all the nations of the earth. What's going to happen is if you don't listen in turn, bad things are going to happen. So let's talk about some of those things. Our text begins by pointing out the time, the context for us. It says it's the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. So we should talk about that guy and know what's going on. This king will help give us some perspective. Jehoiakim, as it says in our text, was the son of Josiah. Josiah is probably one of the more famous kings of, of Judah because he became king when he was my daughter's age. He was eight. And he becomes king and he's considered to be a good king. A king that not only worships the Lord himself, but then leads others to worship as well. And that this is a good thing. And if you go throughout the the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, you'll see there's code words there for if a king is good or not. It says he does things that are good and pleasing or he does things that are evil and wicked. Do things like David or do things unlike David. And Jehoiakim Uh, was the son of Josiah, this good king. But Josiah was eventually killed in battle. You see, Josiah was trusting in the Lord, and he said, live or die, I trust in the Lord for the resurrection of the dead and the life to come, just like we confess. And he goes into battle, and and God delivers a mercy to him. He, He brings him home. He dies in battle, defending God's people, living the life of a believer protecting those who are under his charge as he was called to do. Now, he was killed in battle with a guy named Pharaoh Necho. And you don't have to write that down. He's the the king of Egypt. But Pharaoh then goes to the north and he goes and he fights off in this big, huge battle that uh, is written about in history books in 608 BC called the Battle of Carchemish. And when he comes back, he sees things are a little different in Jerusalem. Josiah's youngest son, Jehoahaz, has become the king. The people are supporting him, and this concerns Pharaoh a little bit, because he did just fight an army here, and he doesn't want to have to do that again. So he takes Jehoahaz, and he takes him, removes him from the throne, he claps him in chains, and is going to take him down to Egypt, where he's going to eventually die. And he decides, hey, what I should do is I should, I should put my own guy on the throne. And so he does that. And he does that in the person of Jehoiakim. But now Jehoiakim, he's the second oldest son. 
in, from Josiah. So it's still a legitimate king that the people would probably accept. He's an older king, and so that's probably a good thing. And, and yet the, also this king, this guy, he's seen what I did to his little brother. He saw what I did to his dad. He's, he's going to do what I say. And for a few years he does. He begins paying tribute to Pharaoh Necho, and things are not good. People are starving. They're hungry and poor. And so Jehoiakim, being a king who wants to not have that going on, so at least he's got that going for him, he reverses course. You see, when Pharaoh went and fought that battle in Carchemish, he was fighting uh, this guy called Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And this king of Babylon was rising in prominence and in power, and Jehoiakim probably looked at that and said, I'm going to throw in my towel with this guy. I'm going to go with Babylon. They're going to protect me. They're going to protect my kingdom. They're going to keep my throne. I'll just, instead of going to Pharaoh, I'll go over here to Nebuchadnezzar, and everything will be fine. He reverses course. He begins paying a lesser tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, But we see here we already have the problem, don't we? Judah, after the good king Josiah's death and after his two sons come, these evil kings who don't believe the promises, don't trust in God, and instead put their trust in the other kingdoms of the world and other kings and other, other armies. That the problem essentially that we have here is they're leading God's people away from the Lord. This is a problem that's been pretty consistent throughout the history of Israel and out the history of, of Judah. The problem here is that Jehoiakim lacks faith and he rebels against God and his promises. He doesn't believe that God is going to do what he says he will do, including the words that Jeremiah preaches, that God is going to bring destruction. He's going to make Jerusalem like Shiloh. I think that's a good thing for us to t- take a look at too. What is he saying when, we, when he says it's going to be like Shiloh? Uh, so you think of Shiloh, the, put that into context for us. Shiloh is the place in the promised land where the tabernacle stayed after the time of the conquest. So there was the, this hill that they put the tabernacle on and, and the armies would be gathered around, they'd be camped around there and they'd go out and they'd fight battles. Well, eventually they ran into some folks called the Philistines and these Philistines were, were handing it to them a little bit. They were beating them pretty good. And so they had this great idea, at least they thought it was a great idea. Why don't we take the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God amongst us and bring that out with us into battle? So they do this against the command of God, and they're defeated again. The Ark of the Covenant is carried away, and that's a whole fun story you can look at, but then the armies of the Philistines come and utterly lay waste to Shiloh. They killed the men, they killed the women, they killed the old, they killed the infants, everybody who was there. And so this is the word that God is speaking to Jehoiakim and to all of the people who are there at the temple. He's saying, you are going to be like Shiloh. You are going to be laid waste because you do not believe the promises of God. And that this is, this is the truth, that, that God has spoken this word to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was doing a good thing. God uses Jeremiah to to try to repeat that which happened after Shiloh when people returned to faith and turned to God and away from their evil ways. He wants to get that before Zion is destroyed. He wants people to repent before he has to bring judgment down upon them. And so he urgently sends his messenger Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, with this word. Jeremiah is challenged. He's trying to do a good thing. But not everybody thinks so. He's challenged by the chief priests. He's challenged by court prophets. And these uh, court prophets, they're they're prophets that were there for the king who who came to to the king and spoke the things that the king wanted to hear. Oh yes, O king, if you turn, turn from Pharaoh and put your trust in Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord will bless you. Because Jehoiakim and all the other evil kings of Judah, not, most of them didn't completely abandon the outward piety of the faith. Instead, what they did is they, 
they would outwardly do these things that appeared to be faithful for the people while mean, meanwhile not believing in the words that are being said. You read about this in, in Isaiah 1 where God says your empty words and your empty sacrifices, your empty new moons and, and festivals that you hold, he says, my soul hates them. They, I abhor them. And this is what Jehoiakim is leading the people in. So he has these false prophets who are around him, these court prophets who, who tickle his ears and, and say, go on, God is on your side, king. No worries because you're the king of God's people. And this sounded good to him. And so these preachers, they're preachers. Jeremiah has already talked about these guys before. In, in, in Jeremiah 23, he says, they are prophets who run without being sent. He says that they are prophets who say they speak for the Lord and the Lord hasn't spoken to them. That these, these preachers are wicked and evil because they are speaking lies. They're speaking things that God has not said. And so we have this contrast here. We have the false court prophets and the, the high priest who, who don't want anyone to be upset. Their motto is, yes, O king. Their motto is, everything is going to be all right. Their motto is, don't do anything to rock the boat. Do everything to maintain the status quo. Do everything you can to, to not be shaken from your throne, O king. So you have them on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have Jeremiah, the prophet who God has called, the prophet who God has spoken to, the prophet who is being sent to go and proclaim the word of God to his people. And on one hand, you have the illegitimate prophets and the high priests who, who seem to have power and, and worldly might and outward piety. And on the other hand, you have Jeremiah, the faithful prophet of God, who the people gather around and say, kill him, get rid of him. They don't get it. They get upset with Jeremiah and the accusation is basically, how dare you come in the name of the Lord and say that you also are going to destroy the city of the Lord or that the city of the Lord will be destroyed. How can you prophesy against Jerusalem and say it will be made like, like Shiloh? The crowd gathers and some of the elders come and they're going to act as judges and, and their, their verdict is that this man should die for what he says. What, what they're, they're saying is this man is commit, saying blasphemy. That's basically the accusation. Jeremiah uses this opportunity though because now he has other leaders from around Judah. He has the attention of everyone and in this time that he has this, this attention, he doesn't quit. He isn't frightened. He isn't terrified. Instead, he, he uses this frightening opportunity where his life is at risk to continue to confess the truth, to agree with God about what God has said, but to also then to proclaim it to those who do not believe it, to speak it forth, to cry out, to cry out, prepare the way of the Lord, to repent. This is the same message of John the Baptist. It's the same message that Jesus says when he comes. It's the same message that your pastors have said throughout the 51 years of this congregation. This is the same message that we hear today. Repent and turn from your evil ways and believe in the promises of God that you may be forgiven, that God's judgment and wrath would not come down on you. And so Jeremiah, he preaches this this message from God, he says, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house. How could I do anything different than that? And after delivering his message one more time, he says, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me what seems right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourself and upon the city and its inhabitants. What faith, what peace, Jeremiah shows as he rests on the word of God, as his life is threatened, as he goes into the most hostile environment that one could to preach this message. What faith does this man have? It's the same faith that throughout the Old Testament says, fear God. And then as he comes to us in the New Testament, and as he does even in the Old Testament, he says, fear not. 
that there's nothing in this world in which we need to fear. We don't need to feel the, fear the crowd that's going to kill us. We don't need to fear the virus that's going to infect us. We don't need to fear anything. We're only to fear God. And yet God, when, when we come to him in faith, he says, fear not. What a beautiful promise we have. This is the peace that Jeremiah is resting in. This isn't just boldness. This is peace that goes beyond the grave. Peace that whatever the devil or the world will assault us with cannot touch us because Jesus has prevailed over the devil and death itself. This peace comes to all those who believe because Jesus too was accused of doing things that were wrong when they were really right. He too was accused in the temple of blasphemy just the same way that Jeremiah was. Jesus too was oppressed by the high priest and vindicated when he was raised from the dead. Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross brings peace between God and between man, between God and those who believe. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he died so that way you and I could be reunited with God forever in paradise, so that way when we do experience the resurrection of the dead and the life that is to come, that we experience that with him in glory and in paradise, a place where there is no more war, there is no famine, there is no pestilence, there is no disease, there is no pain, there is no crying, there is no death. Instead, we bask in the glory of God and we too are glorified in him. This is the promise that we have. In the midst of all of this, the truth is that we have peace with God and so as Christians, we have no need to fear anything. The fear that we do have, the anxiety that we do have, simply points us to the fact that we need, we need Jesus. We need God. We need We need the promises of God that he's spoken that he will relent, that he will deliver his people and bring them into everlasting righteousness. In the words of the famous hymn, which we'll be singing here shortly, A Mighty Fortress, says, The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Now may this peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith In Christ Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.